Uh, and he gives them a list of things that are going to happen, but he concludes it by saying, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Um, Daniel, of course, also speaks of this same seed. Yeah, as a matter of fact, and keep talking while I look that up, because that's a fascinating uh, thought. In, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, where, where Daniel uh, uh, interprets Nebuchadnezzar's prophecy, and, and when he does, he comes up with the most interesting thing, because he talks about that famous statue with a head of gold, you know, and the going all the way down to the feet of clay. And <clears throat> when he gets to those ten toes at the bottom of the statue, which we all have trouble visual visualizing, I know I do. How do you mix iron and clay? It's kind of a funny thing. Doesn't really work all that well. <clears throat> and Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, here's what that means. Daniel uh, 242, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And of course, this is right toward the end of this pro prophesied age of, of, the, of the four Gentile kingdoms. And, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, now miry in the Hebrew means brittle clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And it hit me a long time ago that the, the pronoun they must refer to somebody trying to mix its seed with human beings. Couldn't be clear. And yet it doesn't cleave. It doesn't really cleave. It doesn't work. Why would this mysterious they want to be mingling their seed with the seed of man? Right. That's the question. And the, and the other unusual thing is if you go back to Genesis 3 again, uh, in, in the Proto-Evangelium where you have this opposition between the seed of the serpent. In both cases, you're talking about the word zira, which means offspring, progeny. I mean, it, this to me is one of the most fantastic parts of the study of Scripture. I love the study of Scripture anyway. There's so many amazing things. I mean, I think we would all encourage people to try to become as profoundly interested in the study of the deepest secrets of this book. This has the deepest secrets, much deeper than, <laughs> you know, our current uh, sciences or cosmology or whatever. And, and this idea that Satan could have seed, could have offspring, does that take us back I mean, is there, in other words, uh, when Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, is, is this literally not just the spirit of the Nephilim upon the earth? You remember uh, George Hawkins Pember, the famous uh, English theologian? Oh, yes. In the <clears throat> 1700s, he wrote his masterpiece, Earth's Earliest Ages. It's a wonderful book. It is. And he sets out seven different categories of things that have to happen to fulfill Matthew 24. But, and some of them, he saw them starting to develop in his day, in the late 1800s. But the final one, here's this magnificent theologian this saying that the most fearsome sign, is how he called it, um, that will herald the return of Christ will be the return upon earth of the Nephilim. Wow. This, uh, he refers to it as this unlawful offspring of angels and women. Might we call them aliens? I mean, if they came, and, and by the way, if they came down, so to speak, would they be coming from other worlds or other galaxies, or would they be come, coming from somewhere else? When the Nephilim first came, they didn't come from other uh, galaxies, as far as I know. They didn't come from other planets, right? Well, and what we think of of aliens now might not be coming from other galaxies or other planets either. And uh, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but this was, this was one of the other things early on. And guys like L.A. Marzulli were a decade ahead of me on this. But my mind finally got wrapped around an issue that what I was seeing in the history of the Watchers, whether it was from Egyptian uh, belief with their gods mingling animals and humans and all that, uh, the gods coming down, mating with women, the story out of the book of Enoch, the story out of the book of Jasher, which I think has one of the most single important ancient verses because it actually sounds like advanced biotechnology, but um, that in the course of doing this study, it took me where Lynn has been for a long time. L.A. Marzulli has been for a long time. You've been there, actually, yeah. Gary, for a long time. And that was there, was, there is a current contemporary phenomenon that smacks of, of exactly what was happening in DNA harvesting in the ancient world. And it's recorded not just by theologians, but actually some of the best secular researchers into UFO 
are, are coming across the same phenomenon, harvesting. Now, LA, you know. LA has written uh, a trilogy called the Nephilim Trilogy, and, and, and you've written a, a book called Alien Interviews. Uh, if you kind of synthesize all that, Tom just said that you, you kind of pioneered a study in this field. Uh, we're really bringing Genesis 6 into the modern era, right? I would certainly you know, concur with that. Well, what's interesting about that passage in Daniel is it uses the word cleave. They will not cleave. Their sea will not you know, mingle with men. They will not cleave. And that, that word cleave is the same word that we get in Genesis in, in regard to marriage. And what's interesting, and this takes a minute to set up, what we see in the so-called alien abduction scenario, we see, and this is just a thumbnail sketch of it, the women are taken. They're against their will. They're floated through walls, which is gets into some sort of another type of manipulating matter in physics in ways that we don't know. Right. They're taken aboard a ship. They're impregnated somehow. Um, they find themselves two to three months later, they realize that they're pregnant. They're reabducted. The child, the fetus, is then taken from them. So what we see here is, is a similarity that, that, that harkens back to Genesis, where the fallen angels, and I believe that's what we're looking at here. When we say alien, this slash fallen angel, that, in my opinion, is what we're looking at. And the, the idea that in Genesis 6, there was marriage. They took whoever they wanted, but there were, they were wives. The, the word is cleave. There was marriage. Today, that doesn't exist. They take the women. There is, there is no marriage ceremony or anything like that. They impregnate them. There's a breeding program. And the breeding program today, in my opinion, is similar to that of Genesis, except they're trying to produce, not giants, they're trying to produce a human being that will look like like us, but will be completely demonically enhanced. Well, you know, the Lord said that the fondest desire of a demon was to be able to incarnate itself into human flesh. And we have several episodes in the New Testament where the Lord casts demons out mm -hmm. uh, of people. And essentially, he tells his disciples that the fondest desire of a demon is to be able to incarnate into flesh. So this ties in exactly to what you're saying. In other words, uh, if they can't use humans, they can hybridize another mm -hmm. form of flesh and incarnate themselves into that. And we need to differentiate between fallen angels and Nephilim or demons. Okay. In my opinion, fallen angels are fallen angels. They're part of the, the host of heaven that fell with Lucifer. Yes, and demons, I agree. Demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim left over from the flood. And so they have to, in order to manifest in our dimension, they have to, they have to be in something, either a, a, a person, hence the demoniac, uh, a, a demonically possessed person or a demon possessed person, we would say in, the, in, the, in today's vernacular, or um, perhaps the enemy, the fallen one, has created some sort of a biological interface suit, if you will, where this, this entity, this, this demon can interface with this um, biologically created suit and then manifest in this dimension. Now that sounds really far out. But remember, we're also told that, that Satan, the fallen one, will come with all signs and lying wonders, that he will deceive the elect if that were possible, that unless those days were shortened, all flesh, you know. Yeah, and in my opinion, and I'm sure in yours, the, the way to deceive the elect is to, to stage mm -hmm. the appearance if you will, of uh, a, a contingent from outer space, maybe from uh, Alpha Centauri, you know, or <laughs> Zeta, Reticuli. Zeta Reticuli, or some, some likely spot where they have come as, uh, as ambassadors of goodwill. We're here to help you, you know, or as, as some wag said, we are here to serve you mm -hmm. for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Just but. So but this brings us then to uh, a series of, of discussions that you've had. We're, we're now kind of moving into the field uh, uh, where we're talking about aliens, maybe quote-unquote space aliens, UFOs. A lot of Christians shy away from that topic. Uh, certainly they do, but the, the upside is more and more people are willing to talk about this today. And as it, 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 it's actually entering into the mainstream, uh, we may talk later on about how uh, in January of just this year, the Royal Academy of Scientists, this is the oldest body, uh, scientific body in the world, 350 years was their anniversary uh, this year. And of all things they could have talked about in terms of advances in science or speculating about uh, various cosmological issues or whatever, they picked astrobiology. 
for their 350th anniversary asking this giant question, are we alone in the universe? And so it goes directly to the core of this question. Are we alone? Are we being visited? Are we somehow being manipulated? And people should know that what Lynn Marzulli is talking about, among secular researchers and the best of all of them, Dr. John Mack, Dr. John Keel, J. Allen Hynek, uh, Corso, his book The Day After Roswell, Jacques Vallée, the most respected researchers in the world on this subject, who did research to the point that it could have even been peer-reviewed if there was such a thing of peer-reviewing alien abduction, all of them came to the same conclusion. First of all, that this exactly parallels biblical demonism. It smacks of the historicity of demonic activity. Secondly, that there is the harvesting of what Valet called living energy, cellular matter, for some purpose. And all of them came to conclude what Mac did, that this had to be for the purpose of an awkward joining, he called it, of two species. The purpose, well, it, it, the, the, the movie, you know, that's, uh, the series is playing on television right now, V, they just raised the issue of this alien, half-human, half-reptilian, so, so it's even more specific, child, and we don't know yet where it's going in the series, but is this child going to be put forward as kind of a savior? That something that can bind, the, the bond, the two sides, the reptilian side with the human? Are we being set up? Are we the being question. set up? Tom Horn, L.A. Marzulli, it's been fun, and it's going to continue to be fun. <laughs> Gary Stearman, uh, wishing you uh, all the best. Pray for J.R., will you? And we are thinking about him constantly.